Hello and welcome to this review clip on electronegativity and polarity. As always, make sure you've got your independent study notes on this topic ready and have them with you as we go along because the clip is designed to support them. So electronegativity refers to the tendency or ability of an atom to attract or pull electrons or electron density towards itself along a covalent bond. To fully understand this idea, we have to go back to what a covalent bond actually is. So if you recall that a covalent bond involves the electrostatic attraction between the nuclei of the bonded atoms and the shared pair of electrons, what happens if the nucleus of one atom exerts greater attraction for the electrons than the nucleus of the other atom? So pause the clip and have a think about what might influence this. So in other words, what might cause the shared electrons to become more attracted to one nucleus compared to another? You've probably come uh, to this conclusion already, but things like the nuclear charge, level of shielding and atomic radius will all play a part in determining how effective a nucleus is at attracting electrons towards itself. So in other words, the same things that affect ionisation energy also affect electronegativity at atomic level. So American chemist Linus Pauling um, was the first person to come up with this idea. Um, he came up with a scale to try and explain away the variation in reactivity between elements. And in fact, at the time, it was such a groundbreaking piece of work that he won the 1932 Nobel Prize for coming up with this idea and applying it to the reactivity that people had already seen in uh, the way different elements behaved in the lab. So if we look at the way electronegativity changes across the periodic table, the arrows show the direction of increase in electronegativity. We've, all, uh, we've already mentioned these factors and the importance they, they have in influencing electronegativity. So if we think about um, two covalently bonded atoms having different levels of electronegativity, this leads to a, a lack of balance or an imbalance in the distribution of the electron density, the electron pair in other words, along the covalent bond between them. So let's take two random atoms, a carbon atom and a bromine atom, and I put an over-exaggerated bond between them. The reason I've done this is so we can have a think about where the electron pair, uh, the shared electron pair is going to sit. Now you might notice I've put uh, three squares or three rectangles. They represent the periodic table. So if we now think back to what we were talking about a couple of minutes ago about the trends in electronegativity, and we decide where um, carbon and bromine actually sit. And also remembering that the arrows are the direction of electronegativity increase, it's probably quite easy now to work out that bromine is more electronegative than carbon. So what this means is that the electron pair that's shared between them will sit a bit closer to bromine than it does to carbon. So this effect is called polarity. So we add partial charges to indicate polarity. So this means we refer to the bromine atom as partially negative and the carbon atom is partially positive. And we use the symbol delta plus and delta minus to indicate this. So this bond is also said to possess a permanent dipole. This is because there's a permanent difference in electronegativity between the atoms like we've just discussed. So if you look, you can see that polarity decreases if you go down a group. What's causing this to happen? Pause the clip and see if you can work it out. Now obviously it's because the electronegativity difference uh, decreases. So in no particular order, you get more shielding in the more electronegative atom, in this case the halogen. You get greater atomic radius in the more electronegative atom. So this makes the nucleus less effective at attracting electron density. 
So if we look at all the individual bonds in a molecule and consider the direction the dipoles are acting, we can decide if the molecule is polar overall. So let's look at some quick examples. Take ammonia and we consider the direction that the dipoles are acting in. This molecule is clearly polar because the nitrogen end of the molecule is more negative than the hydrogen ends. So the overall direction in which the combined dipoles act is called the dipole moment. So we draw an arrow with a little line halfway through the arrow like that. So here I've drawn a carbon tetrafluoride molecule, um, tetrahedral in shape, so the, um, the dotted line in the wedge shows the bonds coming into and out of the screen. And uh, although the bonds are polar, there's equal differences in electronegativity because fluorine is the same electronegativity all around the molecule. So the electronegativity difference doesn't change. So dipoles cancel and the molecule is now just, uh, uh, regarded as non-polar, even though there's polar bonds within it. So if we now put a Br in instead of one of the fluorines, bromine is less electronegative than fluorine. So this particular dipole is weaker than the others. So this now means that there is less polarity in that carbon-bromine bond than there is in the other three bonds in the molecule. So that now means that this molecule is polar. So you'll need to consider individual dipoles when predicting whether a molecule is polar overall or not. So the best thing to do now is to go away and try some examples uh, to get the feel for this. It's not something you can just absorb from a clip, it's something that you'll need to go and practice and have a think about. So thanks for your time and until next time, see you soon.